is molecular biology. And he's not a molecular biologist, by the way. Uh, Behe is a biochemist. So anyway, Behe has a new book out. Um, so it's, they, they continue their, their campaign. His new book is The Edge of Evolution, which is already being reviewed. I understand Jerry Coyne has a review of it in, um, I forget where it is, the New Republic. And um, uh, Ken Miller is uh, going to have a review of it in the next issue of Nature, I believe, so you might want to watch for that. Uh, and there's uh, Michael Behe being interviewed by Michael Medved, who's a very ardent supporter of intelligent design. So. Um, and they are now operating, one of the things they started doing even before the Kitzmiller case, they got, they, there was a, a, a proposal in Darby, Montana, a little kind of Dover-like town in Montana to put intelligent design in their tiny little school system there. And um, there was fierce opposition, believe it or not, fierce opposition. And so what the design proponents did was to start cleansing their terminology. They were being advised by the Discovery Institute, by the way. It was working behind the scenes. And so they started, they, they started backing away from the use of the term intelligent design. Uh, my book and other books have exposed it as creationism, so they really don't want that in formal policy proposals anymore. Uh, so now even it's even more urgent that they do that after Kitzmiller. So now they're using code terms, none of which are new, by the way. These are old creationist code terms been around for decades. One, well, then this is new. This one is their original soundbite, Teach the Controversy, the idea that there's a huge controversy about evolution within science. And that, that's very appealing to people. Americans like this idea of letting both sides have their say. But there only, there's only one scientific side here, we keep reminding people. But that's one of the little Trojan horses. Another little Trojan horse is academic freedom. They're doing this in the name of academic freedom. And critical analysis of evolution. These are the code terms now. If these pop up in a policy proposal before a board, a school board, you better watch it because that's what this is about. We've got one in Washita Parish in North Louisiana that's, that's, that's worded now in this sanitized terminology. Uh, strengths and weaknesses of evolution. This is what they want to teach. And they also are arguing uh, that children should be taught the arguments for and against evolution or neo-Darwinism, which is now the book to watch for, the, the substitute for pandas, the supplemental biology text, uh, is explore evolution. Notice now how they've co-opted the evolutionary terminology. This is what they're doing. Now they're, they're, they've co-opted. There are a number of explore evolution sites on the internet which are liter literally, I mean legitimately about evolution, and this can very easily be confused with one of those uh, products. But once you look at the authors, Stephen Meyer, who wouldn't testify in the Dover trial, Paul Nelson, who's a young earth creationist, Jonathan Moneymaker, a longtime intelligent design supporter, Scott Minnick, who testified in the Dover trial, and Ralph Sealkey, who's an intelligent design supporter, um, you know right away that this is, this is more of the same. And if you look at the subtitle, it's written in ID code, the, the arguments for and against neo-Darwinism, right there. Um, so this is a, another example of stealth creationism with sanitized terminology. The book attempts to undermine evolution. It doesn't talk about intelligent design, but it is based on Jonathan Wells' icons of evolution. It does challenge common descent, and it does have ir irreducible complexity in the book. So um, just to give you another little updated item you might want to read, I, I wanted to mention this because I wrote this uh, position paper for the Center for Inquiry, uh, their public policy office in Washington. It's now on the centerforinquiry.net website, and it's, uh, it's my most recent thing I've written, updating people a little bit about the strategy um, that the movement is now using. Um, and these are some other books to read. They're very good books to, get, to give you just kind of perspectives um, on, on this from a number of angles, I do recommend Michelle Goldberg's work because she puts this in the large context of Christian nationalism. Uh, these guys at the Discovery Institute do keep company with Dominionists, Christian Reconstructionists, you probably know. They are, they are closely allied with these people. Um, another, uh, so Kingdom Coming would be a very good one for that. Um, another book, and, and I think it would be very good to read this, is by Keith Miller, who's, who's a geologist in Kansas, a founding member of Kansas Citizens for Science, and also a, a devout evangelical. He's, he's put together a beautiful anthology called Perspectives on an Evolving Creation. And I think it's very important for us, as non-religious people, to work with the, the members of the faith community who are on our side. And it's a very good way to, to understand them and to see how they come at this issue. This was a book of essays by evangelicals for evangelicals in which they explain the challenges of, of, of trying to reconcile their Christian faith with 
they're with doing good science. I highly recommend this book. John Hott is also a theologian who is an expert witness. I recommend reading his work. And there's a little um, Evolution versus Creationism, a good historical introduction by Eugenie Scott. Also, Ken Miller, who is um, uh, one of our witnesses, looks at it from the standpoint of a, uh, of, a, of a believing scientist as well in finding Darwin's God. And then there's the little book, Not in Our Classrooms, I already told you about. Um, I want to end this presentation in the tone in which I began. So to end on the same note, notice, notice how I bookended my presentation with Dembski's, you know. Uh, Dembski helped Ann Coulter write the four chapters in her book, Godless, that are devoted to intelligent design. He was very proud of the fact that he was in constant correspondence with Ann regarding her chapters. And I just can't think of a better way to end it by, other than to quote him. In speaking of Ann Coulter, he calls her the wedge for the masses. Thank you. Mm. Taking what we learned in this case to other things, it seems like our religious brothers and sisters, and especially those on the right, they sort of have a certain pattern when they're attacked, because they're not thinking the truth as, as we are, that there's a psychological pattern that they're using to go, go at each issue. Uh, is anybody, for instance, in, in your thing, uh, the, the personal attack on you, that's one of the things that they like to use. And I can't remember, there seemed to be a pattern through here. They use the pattern when they're attacking uh, rights for, for human rights for women, uh, mm -hmm. human rights for gay people, and, and so forth. Uh, could you comment on this? Did you find a pattern here that, that's in, in other areas that they used to obfuscate the truth? Uh, that, the, that, the Intel, that the Discovery Institute people used? Well, um, well any, the, the, this whole movement well, of, of one of the one of the things they do is to use. I, I think that the the, the, the tactics is is called projection, where if you're doing something that's that's not um, not a good thing to do, uh, like something that's nasty or hateful, um, and you want to divert attention away from the fact that you're doing it, you accuse your opponent of doing it, and they do that all the time. Um, and so that's one of the things that they do. And it's interesting you should ask me about psychological patterns, because one of the books I'm, I'm reading right now, in fact, I brought it on the plane with me, it's John Dean wrote a book called The um, Conservatives Without Conscience. I don't know if you've read that book. Uh, he didn't write it about creationism. It's, 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 he's, he wrote it about you know, some of the neoconservatives in Washington, trying to figure out why people like Rush Limbaugh and Ann Coulter are the kinds of people that they are. And, and he actually looked at a lot of uh, social science research trying to explain these types of personalities. And it, 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 is, it is really amazing how much of what he says corresponds to the way the Discovery Institute creationists behave. Um, they, they are very authoritarian. They can be very mean and, and quite ruthless, and, and they've been very uh, mean in their criticism of, of Judge Jones. So yes, there is a pattern, uh, and it's not, it's not unique to them. It, it's unique to people who, who, for some reason, have personalities um, which are attracted to authoritarianism. And, and so yes, there are, there are patterns that you can recognize. <laughs>